Hello, welcome to The Reasonably Good Life. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brooks. This is a show about using reason to pursue the good life in this complicated world. We are on episode six, which is, are Facebook and Instagram as bad for teens as we fear? You might have read the recent headlines about Frances Haugen. She was a project manager at Facebook and she was concerned about some of the activities of Facebook and the effects it was having, and she leaked some documents. She is the whistleblower that you've heard about. She made the headlines. The Wall Street Journal did a large investigative report based on those leaked documents called the Facebook Files. She appeared before Congress at the US Capitol and answered questions. Um, also, she was on 60 Minutes, and she's probably being interviewed by many media outlets as we speak. So there were some scary headlines in these leaked documents, and that's what I want to dig into. Some of these were accusations that Facebook did not do enough to stop the spread of lies, fake news, and misinformation that there were bad players that they protected or didn't do enough to stop their actions uh, when they were spreading lies, fake news, hatred, things like that. I want to focus on Instagram. So Facebook owns Instagram. And in the leaked documents, there was information that Facebook knew Instagram was harming users, particularly girls, and was not doing enough to stop this. Frances Haugen was concerned about this, and that's why she collected and amassed these documents and leaked them, and she's protected uh, as a whistleblower. So let's dig into this a little more. Now, I've been writing and presenting about the effects of screens on kids, teens, adults, for many years now. I did my dissertation research on the effect of video game violence on kids. Um, I and the author of Tech Generation, Raising Balanced Kids in a Hyperconnected World with my good friend and co-author, Dr. John Lasser. I've been presenting on this all around the country for many years now. I've got upcoming presentations on this topic, and now it's on the front burner once again because of the headlines about these leaked documents. Also, my wife and I have three boys, ages 18, 14, and 10, so we've been navigating screen time challenges ourselves for many years now. You notice they're all boys. Um, if my wife and I had girls, I would have some extra concerns about the effects of social media, but my kids are not really into social media. It's the video games that's the bigger challenge for my wife and I. Um, that's a topic for a different time. I've done some previous YouTube episodes on this, but I'll probably talk about it more. But right now, let's look at Instagram and these leaked documents. First off, I want to say these leaked documents, they're about internal research that Facebook conducted. So they were not uh, representative samples that they took data from, you know, users of all different stripes. Um, it was not conducted in a way for publication in an academic journal. Those studies tend to be more rigorous and have more checks and balances built in. And also, Francis Haugen, we've got selected documents. So we don't know, maybe they have a lot of documents about how Facebook or Instagram was helpful for users, but Francis Haugen wasn't concerned about that part. She's concerned about the harmful effects. I am concerned about harmful effects too, so I want to be clear about that. It's just that oftentimes reality isn't as scary as the headlines or how our own fears would have us believe. So think of the Wizard of Oz that, you know, there's the curtain and, you know, we're scared of the wizard, but when we pull back the curtain, it's not near as bad. Often when we look behind the headlines and we look at the actual data, it's not as scary as the headline. So that's what I'd say is the case here. When we look more closely at the 
data in the leaked documents, it's not near as scary or as damning as the headlines. Now a quick word about the Reasonably Good Life sponsor, Pinwheel. Pinwheel is a phone designed to be a smarter phone for kids and teens. It's a tool and not a toy. It has the most useful features of smartphones without all of the trappings that concern parents. I've served as a consultant for the development of Pinwheel, and my 10-year-old has one and loves it, and my wife and I love it too. If you go to pinwheel.com and order a phone, you can get a 10% discount by using this code, BROOKS10. That's spelled out T-E-N, and it's all one word, BROOKS10. Now, back to the reasonably good life. The research conducted internally was based mainly on self-reports of teens. So they did not use objective measures of well-being. They just were asking the teens of how did this make you feel? Did this make you feel worse? Some of the questions were like leading the witness. Did using Instagram may make you feel worse about your body is kind of a leading question, right? So that is one of the, the data points that came out in these leaked documents is 30% of teen girls felt Instagram made them feel worse about their bodies. That sounds very alarming, right? However, this is a subset of users. So one is there are all the Instagram users. There's a subset of teen users. And then they did a study with a subset of those teen users of several thousand users. And what they found is a percentage of them did say that Instagram, using Instagram, they felt like Instagram made them feel worse about their bodies. But this was 150 girls who already said they felt self-conscious about their bodies. They already had body image issues. So the, the girls who already said they had body image issues, those are the ones who said that they felt like Instagram made them feel worse about their bodies. So this is a subset of users and not 30% of all Instagram users. Also, what was reported that seemed very scary is 6% of US and 13% of UK users blamed Instagram for having suicidal thoughts. Yikes, that's very scary. However, it actually, the number was 16 users out of 2,500 users reported that it increased, that they blamed Instagram for having suicidal thoughts, 16 of 2,500. So that's just over half of 1% of users, not you know, as high as, as it's showing in the media. So the way they sliced and diced the statistics, they ended up reporting a figure that was a lot higher than the actual figure. The headline, again, is scarier than the actual data. Now, I don't want to sweep that under the rug at all, because I'm sure that a certain percentage of users, you know, it, it could have a negative effect, but it isn't near as scary as the initial reports when you look behind the curtain. What does the research show when we look at there's been you know hundreds of studies now on the effects of screens maybe thousands um, on, on kids and teens um, what do the what does the research show so when we look at that research some of the earlier studies seem to indicate that screens were having a fairly negative impact on young people but those research studies were mostly correlational. They weren't always very well designed. Um, some of the more negative ones made the headlines, but if it wasn't negative, it didn't make the headlines. So what we find when we look at the body of research, some research finds that screens have benefits for kids. Some show that it can have negative effects and many studies show not much of either. Now, if you think of our well being, our happiness is a pie chart, you know, and, and all these different things contribute to our happiness, right? Genetics being a very large part of that, but there's so many other factors. If I had to ask you what percentage of your overall happiness was determined by your screen use, pick out a number, think about it. 
What the research shows, even the research that finds that screens can have negative effects, when you look more closely at the data, it, it's small, it's a small percentage. So it may be like only 1%, 2% of happiness and well being are affected by our screen use. Now, one thing that can happen is our screen use in the moment can have positive or negative effects. So if we get zinged on social media by someone or negative comment to a post, um, or on the other hand, maybe we laugh at a meme or we share something, we watch a blooper reel on YouTube, you know, makes us laugh and okay, in that moment we're feeling happy or at the other moment when someone zings us on social media, we might feel negative. So it could be true that we feel those feelings at the time and it doesn't affect our overall, overall well-being. Just like a, a great movie you saw last week or a great dinner you had doesn't affect your well-being all that much overall, like probably zero for if it's been a week. Um, and the same with screens is if you look at the overall effect on well-being for most users, it has very little effect positive or negative. Another thing that they found in the research is that better design studies tend to find smaller effects or no effects of screen time. So it's something to keep in mind that the larger studies and the meta-analyses, so a meta-analysis is a study of studies when they aggregate the data of across many studies, what they're finding there is that very few uh, negative effects are, are found. It, it just doesn't seem to affect kids or teens' happiness or well being all that much. Let's take a look at some findings from some very large, uh, uh, big, and recent studies of how screens are affecting well being. There was a 2021 Common Sense Media and Hope Lab report uh, in which researchers Vicki Rideout and her colleagues found, and this is, is um, this was a survey, so you know, self-reported, kind of like the Facebook data, but notice the contrast in the findings from this with thousands of users. This is what they found. Young people are far more likely to say that using social media makes them feel better rather than worse when they're depressed, stressed, or anxious. And that rate has gone up substantially since 2018. What? That's very different than those leaked Facebook documents. How could that be? Now, one thing is those negative news stories tend to make the headlines. You probably didn't see a headline about this uh, Common Sense Media and Hope Lab report, did you? Here's another one. This is a 2021 study. It's uh, part of the ABCD study. And this is a huge study with uh, thousands of participants where uh, with multi-site uh, across the United States. I think it's mostly United States or if all the United States. Um, it's ABCD, Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. And this was with almost 12,000 9 to 10 year olds. Now I know it's not teenagers, but this is a huge study and it's very rigorous, like best of the best uh, methodology that they're looking at this. And here's what they concluded. The small effect sizes observed suggest that increased screen time is unlikely to be directly harmful to nine and 10 year old children. That's a huge study. Did, did we get headlines on the findings from that? No, uh, you didn't read them. I didn't read them. I had to dig for them and I ran across this. Um, here's another one. This is a 2020 literature review by Odgers and Jensen. And this was, uh, a, again, a literature review. So they were looking at you know many, many studies on the effects of screens on young people. And here's what they found. The most recent and rigorous large-scale pre-registered studies report small associations between the amount of daily digital technology usage and adolescents' well-being that do not offer a way of distinguishing cause from effect and, as estimated, are unlikely to be of clinical or practical significance. 
Okay, that was a lot said, but basically they didn't find that the, the best studies of their kind were basically not finding that screens were having much of an impact on well being. Here are the results of a recent meta analysis. It's from 2021 by Dr. Christopher J. Ferguson. He's a psychology professor at Stetson University. He, along with 13 other colleagues from an international team, did a meta analysis, a study of studies of the effects of screens on kids and teens. And here's what they concluded. Screen media plays little role in mental health concerns. Now, of course, there are studies that find negative effects of screens on young people. However, when we look closely at the data, those effects tend to be small and the better designed studies and the larger studies tend to find very few, if any, negative effects. Why do we get the impression that screens are so negative? These Facebook files are a case in point. They made the headlines, right? And now we're probably more convinced than ever that kids are going to hell in a handbasket because of their use of screens. Now, one thing that happens, and I've talked about this before, is with the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Negative news, we're, we're drawn to it kind of like moths to a flame. And this is that negativity bias that I spoke of. We're drawn to negative news over positive news. So the media puts the headline negative news, it gets more eyeballs, more attention, more clicks, and of course, more ad revenue. Um, so studies that don't find negative effects of screens, they might get some press coverage, but not near as much. And they don't get all the likes and shares that, you know, these negative findings like, oh my God, look what's happening with screens. And they get shared and, um, you know, posted and all that stuff. So that gives us the impression, because we can easily think of examples of things we've seen, read, or even experienced with screens, like firsthand, like, oh, we, we heard a kid. So this, this happens a lot when I present. We, we often think anecdotally, and we come up with these uh, examples of, uh, oh, well, I know screens can cause a lot of harm because I know this girl, she was a straight A student and she wasn't on Instagram or anything, but once she got on it, her grades went down. She started taking all these selfies and posting them. And then she was getting all concerned about the likes and the comments. And she started posting risque photos and, and nudes and then she started cutting herself and she got very depressed. She was failing all her classes. Her mom had to pull her out of school and she ended up in a residential treatment center. So those stories get spread. The stories that a student got cyberbullied and they committed suicide, those make the headlines. Now those things do happen. So it is scary and it is worrisome. And this is the weird part. When you aggregate the data, you don't see a pervasive negative effect of screens. Yet the headlines tell us they are negative. And these anecdotal stories also say they're negative. How could this be? It's both and. These things can coexist. In general, most kids and teens are not significantly affected by their screen use, positive or negative. And there are subgroups out there who are more negatively affected by screens, and some could be substantially so. For instance, cyberbullying does cause negative effects. So if a kid is experiencing a lot of cyberbullying, they are likely to get depressed and anxious and maybe even suicidal. You know, it's a sad thing that happens. However, those stories make the headlines. What doesn't make the headlines is a story that 
a kid was feeling depressed and um, they posted some things about it and their friends reached out to them and it really helped them through a dark time. Those stories are happening too, but they don't get our attention. They don't make the headlines as much. There are stories of kids who were suicidal and posted about it and someone came to their aid and basically saved them from committing suicide. But again, those don't make the headlines. So what you have is some kids may benefit from screens a lot. Some kids, they may subgroups, they fare worse from their screen use. When you aggregate it all, those sort of cancel each other out. And then you have a large middle group of kids that mostly don't get affected one way or the other too much by their screen use in the long run. I hope that makes sense because I do not want to give you the impression I don't care about screens. I cared enough to write a book on it and I'm still concerned. However, we can't run around like the sky is falling. Our level of concern about screens should match the level of threat. And for most kids, we cannot think that the average kid who's kind of happy-go-lucky is going to start using screens or play Fortnite or, or whatever, get a smartphone, and they're just going to go down the tubes. That is not what happens for the typical user. The takeaway in all this is that for most kids, screens are not having a significant negative impact on their well being, in positive or negative. Um, there are subgroups who might be more affected. Now, this is the thing that researchers need to tease out. We need to understand the nuance of how screens are affecting us because. For those subgroups of kids who might be negatively affected by screens, like a depressed girl who has body image issues, indeed, might be likely to have a negative experience from Instagram and make her more self-conscious and more depressed. We need to understand that better. Facebook, I am calling you out. Facebook you have the tools at your disposal. You have the people, the money, the resources, the expertise to delve into this in a more empirical fashion. And what you need to do is partner with academics so that the two of you can come together and understand this better. Because we really need to understand is how can we get the most out of our screens? I think screens can be wonderful and they can bring out the good in us. However, we there is a dark side and we've seen it play out. And I'm worried about many uses of the screen, especially, and I'll tackle this in the next episode, the spread of fake news, lies, and conspiracy theories. But I think if Facebook could partner with academics, we could have a much better understanding of how screens are affecting us and capitalize on more of the positives and we could start to minimize some of those negatives that are indeed out there. Well, that wraps up this episode of The Reasonably Good Life. I've been your host, Dr. Mike Brooks. Be curious, be flexible, be kind, and for goodness sakes, be reasonable. And I hope to see you at my next episode. Hey, thanks again for joining me today. I want to give a special shout out to Eric Kenow and Patrick Kennedy for their help with both the podcast and YouTube versions of The Reasonably Good Life. If you enjoyed this episode, I always appreciate follows, likes, and shares. Also, if you want to follow me, my website is www.drmikebrooks.com. For Instagram and Twitter, I am at Dr. Mike Brooks. For Facebook, it's Dr. Mike Brooks dash The Reasonably Good Life. And for email, you can contact me at contact at reasonablygoodlife.com. Thanks again, and I hope to see you next time.